Okay, hey everyone. Today is the 23rd of March here at Howdy McCoskey Talks. And we're continuing our series of Southern France. And uh, today's uh, is going to be perhaps uh, not as, um, what's the word, not as exciting or, or enthralling on the surface, but you can't possibly begin to understand what might be happening with Berenger Saunier and, and all the events of the 1800s in France without looking into the 1600s. And you have to look into all sorts of things from the Company Saint Sacrament, uh, Sulpice, the Society Saint Sulpice, John Ollier, uh, amazingly the foundation of Montreal, Canada, which was originally known as Ville Marie and has a bizarre story of its founding. Um, at the same time frame, we're looking at the stories of Christian Rosenkreutz that came out of um, came out of Bohemia. Uh, you're looking at people like John D. and uh, Francis Bacon, uh, because the 1600s recall. Okay, yes, we've got the Poussin and the Ten Years paintings that are going on at that time, but this is also the the, the, the colonization time of the New World, supposedly according to our our current historical record. Right, so you've got the American colonies being formed, be they Jamestown or or um, the Pilgrim colonies in Plymouth, and you've got all through Nova Scotia and uh, Quebec being um, settled by the French in Canada. So this all links together, and and, and I thought it was time to do this. I just done a uh, the the interview or not an interview, I guess the conversation is the best way to have it with Emily Moyer and um, Michael over at Susquehanna Alchemy turned out to be a discussion uh, from Michael's decision about the Mayflower, this very strange Mayflower uh, recreation that's happening this year, which seems to be a gigantic ritual. And we were linking it back to the Mayflower, original Mayflower pilgrims and really trying to dig into it. So in one sense, this is expanding it, but we're going to be looking into France and Canada in order to understand some of the, some of what's going on uh, in this, in this time frame. So I want to look first at, uh, at the company sets at the company set sacrament because we've got the Knights Templar have gone away the Cathars have supposedly gone away but France is still being run by some very underground myst 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 mystical organizations one of these is the company of the blessed sacrament uh, and uh, this was formed in 1630 I don't have a good photo actually of anything uh, for this particular one um, but it had a lot of key figures that were a part of its founding including Jean-Jacques Ollier Oh, I guess what's the founder? He was a member, and as well as Saint Vincent de Paul, and we're going to have to talk about both of these people uh, as we go along. But first, we'll talk. We'll say what the Company of the Blessed Sacrament was, right? Founded in March 1630, um, it was never. It was seemingly accepted by the king, but not by Louis, but not not fully sanctioned, you might say. Um, supposedly, the job of this com of this group was to correct abuses among the clergy and monasteries in order to ensure good behavior in churches, procure missions for rural parishes, and the establishment of the seminary of foreign missions for the evangelizing of non-Christians, as well as caring for the poor, improvement of hospitals, uh, administration of prisons, uh, so the poor would have legal advice. In general, it sounds like a pretty good thing that they're doing, but is that really what they're really all about? Because the order's own statutes in its stay the primary channel which shapes the spirit of this company and which is essential to it is the secret. The secret. So what secret are they talking about? And to historians who try to explain this group, they have no idea how to explain it because, well, it's claimed they're doing all this charity work. They're really involved in seemingly spying, infiltrating the government, uh, doing all sorts of things that make no sense. It continued until the 1660s when it was seemingly eliminated by the king at that time. So let's look at first Vincent de Paul. Now Vincent de Paul comes up in the story of Rennes le Chateau many, many times. He appears in the documents of the Serpent Rouge that we'll look at uh, coming up. He appears quite often in, in connection to Berenger Saunier that there was this thing that was being followed. So who is this guy? Well, you can look him up on the, on the internet, of course, yourself in detail, but very simply, he was he was one of sort of the two spiritual mystics that turned out to be the the teacher of Jean Jacques Ollier, the one who became in charge of Saint Sulpice, and 
Vincent de Paul is a bizarre story. Uh, supposedly born in 1576, he claimed he was captured by Turkish pirates in 1605 and made a slave for two years before escaping. He then claims that he was captured again, uh, but his new owner was not really a slave owner. He was an alchemist. And so instead of making him a slave, he initiated Vincent de Paul into the secrets of finding the Philosopher's Stone. Upon escaping in 1607, he returned to France, immediately was sent by somebody to Rome to meet the Pope, who allowed him to stay and continue his studies. Um, Vincent wrote several letter, letters after returning on how he had learned thousands of geometrical things and how he could turn ordinary metal into silver or gold. In other letters, he spoke of learning magic tricks like how to make a dead man's head talk um, uh, to scare people. What else? What did he learn to do? What did he really learn to do? What was he really doing? Where, 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 what, was he really captured for two years by Turkish pirates? If so, where was he? Was he really captured? Was he really working with an alchemist? What we do know is, or what seems to happen, is he left Rome in 1609. He was sent on a secret mission by Henry IV. Who knows whatever that secret mission was. Some have speculated it was teach the king and Cardinal Richelieu the secret of making gold. Then in 1610, the French king is murdered. And by, by and, oh, and uh, Vincent de Paul's career explodes. By 1638, he had formed a special thing called the Enfance Trouveau, which is dedicated to the care of abandoned children, orphans. And orphans will become a key element of the story of the 1600s. It links, of course, to the key elements of the 1800s, of the very time that not only the, the mission pillar is put up by Saunier in Rennes Chateau, but at the time of the orphanages and the orphan trains in the United States, so right away it begins to question if we're dealing with the 1800s as being a possible uh, reset period of North America, are we looking at the 1600s as being a possible reset period of Europe? So we're keeping all that in mind of what's happening in the 1600s, but that's Vincent de Paul, and he's a key member of that society. From that society comes the Society St. Sulpice. And the Society St. Sulpice, you can see, has this particular motto, this very unique stylized M inside of a, almost outside inside a pyramid. And it was formed by Jean-Jacques Ollier. Uh, and I think we should talk about Ollier first. This is Jean, this is supposed to be Jean-Jacques. Of course, we never know who these people are, right? They're 16th, 17th century portraits. Who knows who it's a portrait of, but this is who it's claimed to be, Jean-Jacques Ollier. Now, Ollier plays unbelievable keys again in this story uh, because, um, because St. Sulpice, uh, it's very clear in the story of Rennes Chateau. Uh, Ollier specifically founded the, the Society St. Sulpice in 1641, gathering priests and seminaries around him, first in a suburb of Paris, uh, but shortly thereafter was invited to St. Sulpice, where the, the, I don't know, the priest, the bishop, whoever at the time felt had gone into disrepair and named his society after the church, where he built a seminary next to it and, uh, and, and got uh, official um, official uh, place for it. Now, Jean-Jacques Ollier is a really, he's a mystic dude. That's the only way I can describe him. So he's a priest who's been trained by these, these two guys, by uh, Jean-Jacques Ollier, or by um, uh, Vincent de Paul, and by um, oh, do, 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 Charles de Condron, another sort of mystic of the period. Ollier, in 1631, I think, supposedly has his eyesight start to fail, and he makes a pilgrimage here to the Shrine of the Holy House in Loreto in Italy, where the, the presentation is not only did he get a cure of his, I guess, failing eyesight, but also a complete religious conversion. Now, what's so interesting about this place, um, this particular basilica of Santa Casa in, uh, in uh, Loreto, uh, Italy, is that it's supposed to have this, which is called the Holy House, the Santa Casa, which is supposed to be, interestingly, uh, a, a niche that has a 33-inch 33, 33 high, interesting, 33-inch high black image of the Virgin and Child made of Lebanon cedar uh, adorned with jewels and placed above the altar. So again, one of these black Madonnas. And I think... I've read somewhere, I've had trouble remembering where I'd read this, but they claim that this particular uh, screen 
this thing that you see that's placed around it uh, is all part of the original place where the Annunciation happened, the actual and the actual Annunciation in in um, in the Holy Land, uh, or or I guess it's from from the, yeah from the Basilica of the Annunciation. So that makes the the place very and of course the Annunciation is uh, as you know I have that photo on my wall I look at it every day. Uh, the Annunciation is this. In a biblical term, right, the, the spark of the of the Holy Spirit putting Jesus into the Virgin Mary, but it's the it's the it's reminiscent of this. Anytime the Holy Spirit, you might say, comes to anyone and provides that divine spark of knowledge or understanding, the Annunciation is this is this link between it's the it's the almost like the touching of the fingers on the Sistine Chapel. That's between God and Adam. That that's an Annunciation moment. So all of these so. Olier goes to this particular point with a black Madonna, and as we know, black Madonnas become very important later on in the story of Renma Chateau um, and, and how they link to, to what's going on. So we have Olier first doing that. But then in 1641, just as he forms St. Sulpice, he goes through what's classified as like a two-year mess of great anguish and metaphysical torment, a deep depression during which he was preaching bizarre things and he felt his soul had been corrupted. His recovery was partially due to pilgrimages to Chartres to pray at the foot of a of Notre Dame or the black or the black virgin there, and to his two spiritual mystical teachers, De Paul and this De Condra. So now first he goes first he goes to have a healing slash conversion almost or awakening to this uh, Annunciation point in Italy. Then he gets his next one at Chartres, and and. Uh, Chartres is one of the absolute key cathedrals. I would call I would call it the, the, the key cathedral in the world. Actually, it's it, it's energetically there's nothing there's nothing like it anywhere else on earth. Chartres is beyond special and beyond beyond a token of wisdom. And and as I understand, Ole wanted to form a society at Chartres, but for some reason couldn't, so wound up at Saint Sulpice. So what, what's interesting about St. Sulpice? Okay, so here's some pictures from my last trip to, uh, to Paris when I went and I spent, uh, I made sure I stayed at a hotel very close to St. Sulpice so I could be there. I went there every day, actually. Um, and Sulpice is um, so unique. Let me just bring up my photos here so I can see what I'm looking at. Um, because the interior of it is so cold and stark, it's particularly when you compare it to uh, the churches of Rome or, or Florence or, it, it, well, it has artwork and it, 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 it's, uh, it, it doesn't have the same, it doesn't burst to your senses uh, like, say, Chartres does. It, 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 it's more like, and it's cold inside. I, went, I was there in the summertime and it was still cold inside Sulpice, uh, but it has some very famous artwork that you're going to see here. I don't want to go into, into a detail. We, we, we'll go into the specifics of St. Sulpice and the specifics of it when I look at the Serpent Rouge, because the Serpent Rouge links directly to uh, information on Sulpice. But I just wanted to let you see that it has some very uh, specific artwork, uh, some specific tombs, and it has this, which is the famed, um, well, oh, sorry, it has, it has this, um, this is one of my most interesting ones there. This is Jesus coming out of the tomb. Opening the opening the tomb door, and you can see the the very unique stylized way the the he's being received by the different members. This is a really interesting painting to me, but um, it's 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 uh, this the um, the uh, genome uh, nomen the the astronomical line that runs through Paris. That that's. Is it the rose line that it's actually marking? I don't, I can't remember off the top of my head what it's actually marking, but it's one of these um, key astronomical lines, and it goes right through Sulpice, and it has, it, it's, you know, it's an important marker with the obelisk and the and the ball on top, and it has this as well in Sulpice, this stylized M slash V, of course, the very thing that became the motto of the Society Saint Sulpice. So, is this stained glass? Is the stained glass? Built because of the motto that had been created, or was the motto taken from the taken from the stained glass, which was there much prior to the creation of of the company of the of the of the um, Society Saint Sulpice, 
and um, of course, the, so many are speculating that the M is Mary Magdalene and represents the Holy Grail, right? And these the, the bushes underneath uh, and the flowers and everything else all have relation to the Grail and, and the Grail story. So still, so yeah, so St. Sulpice is, uh, has this sort of, again, this underlying foundation of all of these things that are happening in France at this time. During the 1640s or 1650s, there's a civil war going on in France that most people don't really know about. Yeah, a giant civil war, particularly in Paris. The, the, the Paris was a, was a mess during this period, which and there were tons, supposedly tons of orphans from the end of this civil war. Uh, so again, is it really a civil war? Is it some kind of attack slash something else that's going on? I mean, this is um, this is a really important thing to look into because if we're looking at the time of a reset, um, we might be getting information on, on what's really going on there. St. Saltpiece is linked to another St. Saltpiece, Church of St. Saltpiece, and that's in Montreal, Canada. And Montreal, Canada definitely links to the story of um, of Rennes-le-Chateau, that, that's for sure. It was originally named Ville-Marie, uh, the city of uh, city of Mary, right? City of, uh, they claim the Virgin, but I think it's the city of the Magdalene. And I've still, I've got my crutch, by the way, for the, I'm still struggling with my knee. But anyway, um, uh, Montreal, Canada. So, uh, Montreal, Canada, it was directly, the, the entire city and its foundation was directly handled by Jean Ollier. So the very guy who's in charge of this underground, secret, uh, the very strange priestly society is the one who's in charge of the society, uh, the, which is called actually the Society Notre Dame de Montreal, um, whose patron saint would, of course, be, they, they claim the Virgin Mary in, in their thing, but we're not sure which Mary, of course, they might be linked to, and uh, and it's 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 an unbelievable story, in some ways. Um, you have to remember that the, the foundation of Quebec originally started the, the province of Quebec. Uh, well, we had the, the voyages of Jacques, of Jacques Cartier in 15, 1530s, and he was the first one to uh, found the city of Montreal, Montreal Island. Um, he was on a Christian mission. Uh, and he had, uh, Cartier had, had the Red Crusader cross on his ships. Um, at the top of the islands was a 232 meter high mountain where he found an Iroquois village named Huchilaga, but Cartier later renamed it Mount Royal, Montreal. Now, Mount Royal is a very, Montreal is, is the mountain of southern France, Montreal de Sauce. And Montreal de Sauce, you can see from this photograph, is has the cave, what's called the cave of the grail images, where you see the lance and the grail and the all sorts of grail iconography on the wall of this cave on top had been a, a castle, which should have been the, the uh, main Templar um, protective castle. It was a castle that was never actually defeated as opposed to the ones that they claim that the Knights Templar had been had as their main castle. It was probably Montreal de Sauce, and underneath Montreal de Sauce is this obviously initiatory cave into the Grail mysteries and the Grail romance and the Grail. Uh, probably the actual receiving of the Holy Grail may have happened. And then Cartier goes to Montreal, and the first thing he does is call the city, or call, sorry, call the city, call the mountain there, Mount Royal, that he wants to make sure that it's being linked right away to the story of Southern France. Uh, in the early 1600s, the next colonization comes from Samuel de Champlain, and Champlain specifically stops what, at what's now Quebec City. And Quebec City, uh, Quebec City was he, Cartier, or Cartier, de Champlain, and the and the people involved in his journey were all uh, either Knights of Malta or Jesuits. So Knights of Malta and Jesuits were the original founders of of the what we now know as, as the province of Quebec in Canada. So it was a, it was a Knights of Malta dominated thing. And this goes on until the 1640s when, for some unknown reason that no one can explain, Jean-Jacques Ollier decides to create a new company to send 50 people to settle in the place of Mount Royal, which they, which they were gonna name Ville Marie, right? And the people, the main people involved in this, be they uh, a guy named de Maisonneuve, um, Jean Mance, 
the woman John Mance, who was Jeanne, Jeanne Mance, right? Uh, and I can't think of the other two of the two main members of my head. They were all brought together from different parts of France, supposedly by the most unreal mystical visions that told them they were supposed to be on this particular journey to of something that God had chosen them for this journey to set up the place of Montreal. And I'll leave it to you. I, I read the accounts in a book called um, Holy Grail Across America, something like that. I can't remember the name. I'll put the book up so you can see it. But uh, the, all the account, all of their mystical accounts are in there. I tried to look at the Wikipedia pages on these people, but they don't list any of the of their of their uh, visions. The visions are wild, supposedly. The, I mean, literally the kind of things that like a high-ranking shaman would have. So who are these people that are going to set up Montreal to start with, all having these kinds of visions? And in fact, there are speculations that Poussin's painting in 1640 is actually showing the four original founders of the city of Montreal in Canada. That's one of the theories of who who they've been stylized on to make sure that they look like the four members of this group going to Canada. Um, without going into, into, I don't want to go into massive detail on this, but um, one of the well, all the money that all the money that came for setting up the uh, setting up Montreal came from Saint Sulpice. And what was happening was there was this beginning to be this rivalry right off the bat that Quebec City was the seat of the Jesuits in the Order of Malta. And this guy de Maisonneuve immediately refused to take any orders from any of the governors of Quebec City. Uh, in fact, his ships were stopped at Quebec City and, and for a long time weren't even allowed to go past it. And it seems that um, the, Freema the Freemasons and the Knights of Malta were extremely focused on not just the colonization the colonization work and, and the focus of what's happening at Quebec. And this settlement or this, this work at Montreal was like a group opposing, trying to oppose what was happening in Quebec City. You could almost say that the Knights, the Knights Templar and the Knights of Malta were still active in Quebec and still in some form of battle or rivalry going on with the control of these cities. When de Maisonneuve gets there in, on, in January of 1642, one of the first things he does is he carries a cross to the top of Mount Royal, almost an imitation of the journey of Christ. On reaching the top, he was knighted the first soldier of the cross, and then during an official ceremony, a priest gave the same traditional prayer that was said to the blessing of crusaders before going to the Holy Land. So what sort of initiation was going on? Was it some sort of illumination, enlightenment moment that was going on? Was it recalling some sort of Knights Templar crusade analogy? I mean, he was made a knight in a, in a, in a knighting ceremony, uh, supposedly very similar to the Freemasonic uh, second grade of the cross. So you have right away visions, mystics, um, this background of Ollier and his, and his group, and all of a sudden you've got one of the first things that happens is this semi-recreation of Christ slash Knights Templar um, experience. Um, supposedly, the company Sat Sacrament, who is, you know, behind the link to what's happening at St. Sulpice, has, the, uh, has an objective to do, to do good and fight evil by any means. And you have to wonder, well, what's Montreal's role in this? Because there was a belief that Montreal would be the new Jerusalem. A lot of this is coming, by the way, from this book. I forgot to put it up earlier. Francine Beranger. I should have brought it over before I started. But it's called, I think, something like the Templars. Again, I'll, I'll put the, the book is on the, on, on the screen now for you. Something like the Templars in Montreal and the new Jerusalem. But, but they were, they, there was also this idea that Montreal was the new Jerusalem. And it was not just that, that it had this unbelievable city. And, and interestingly, John the Baptist plays an unbelievably important role in what's going on in Quebec. If you, if you live in Quebec now, you know their national day is uh, June the 24th, St. John Baptiste Day. It's actually, it's actually a festival in order of the Baptist. Um, not to anything else, not to some sort of liberation of Quebec, not to the founding of Quebec, it's to John the, just, it, it's to John the Baptist. And, and in supposedly, all of these places were supposed to be set up to the Holy Trinity, but if you go in front of Notre Dame Church in Montreal, you're going to see Mary, Joseph, and John the Baptist. 
Jesus is not in that, is not in the three statues. Why is John the Baptist there and not Jesus, but Mary and Joseph are? You're also going to find a ton of Templar and Masonic stone marks all over Old Montreal, and it's got tunnels like that run all the way from St. Sulpice Cemetery in, in Montreal to the old Notre Dame Church. Um, again, her, her book goes into in tremendous detail of some of the old cities, some of the old churches, some of the old paintings, some of the old statues. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic read if you're interested in looking at the possibility of this link between what's going on and what might be going on in France in the 1600s and what's happening in this new city of Montreal. Also interesting was the coat of arms of Jean Mans, the, the, the female who was part of one of the four original members of the found, key members of the founding of Montreal and, and could be thought of as the shepherdess, right? She could be thought of as the shepherdess of Montreal, uh, similar to how the shepherdess is in the painting of Poussin. And she has the coat of arms for her family is a gold tree with 12 blue apples in it. And so the name Mance, some suggest, links to the Mancellier tree, whose apples and sap are poisonous. So that means you've got the symbol of life in the gold, in the alchemic transformation of the gold, and you've got the apples, which can be poisonous. So you've got the idea of death in it. You've got these blue apples, which are and they're specifically blue apples, right, which are that 12 blue apples shows up in, the, in that one decoded parchment. So you're wondering, is the message of noon blue apples, really 12 blue apples, somehow related to this particular coat of arms? And if so, what is the coat of arms which is linking to, to gold and to possibly a Gnostic death and transformation and all these kind of things, and then linked to the city of Montreal? So again, it's very, it's very interesting that you have to potentially link the Rennes le Chateau story to the story of the Templars and the Grail, to the story of Montreal de Sauce, to the story of Montreal, Canada. Bizarrely, I also saw some links to Calgary, but I don't want to get into that uh, here, but I did find some very strange um, grail links actually in, in the old French part of uh, Quebec City and perhaps or of Calgary. And so perhaps I will, in another video later on, I'll pull up all of those um, photographs that I took, wow, 15 years ago or something, 10 years ago um, when I was in, maybe 10 years ago when I was in Calgary. and. Um, Anyway, so that's a little bit on the story of the founding of Montreal, and, and I highly want you to see that uh, it's linked. Uh, how the link is exactly formed, this, this lasts until like the 1660s when the company Sat Sacrament is, 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 is taken over, the Society St. Sulpice is taken over, Jean Ollier is dead, um, and at that point, de Maisonneuve is kicked out, uh, the, who, the founder of Montreal was kicked out of Montreal, and uh, an entirely new group winds up taking over and takes control of the city, much more linked to what's happening in Quebec City. And this, it's like the original foundation uh, in the 1660s, or this, this, you might call it the spiritual mission, at least openly, is squashed, taken over, and this is the exact time that Poussin stops his painting. Um, so all of these things seem somehow very much linked. A couple other things to keep in mind that during this during this rough time frame, you've got what's known as the the beginning of Rosicrucianism uh, and the story of Christian Rosencruz, which comes from the Czech Republic, uh, which is now the Czech Republic, uh, in three strange manuscripts: three, the Hermetic number, uh, one in 1612, known as the Fama Fraternius, the Confessio in 1615, and the Chemical Wedding in 1616. And uh, in, the in the Fama, in the first one, it, be, it starts by saying, most will scoff at thinking one can gain the knowledge of nature. But the original founders of this order, which are four in number, traveled highly in the East, which might mean Egypt or India or the Far East or all of it. And the total of their knowledge was placed into a book. Once the group of four became eight, thus became Hermetic, uh, Tehute, uh, they then began to go out and teach others. The manuscript says that while they could not live longer lives, they did live without pain, illness, or suffering. Um, and it all links all this. And if you go into the into these stories of Christian Rosencrantz, it reads like a hermetic tale. I mean, it's literally a hermetic tale. Why is it important? Because the similarity of what you're going to read when you when you go through the story of this Christian Rosencrantz is almost the same story. <coughs> Excuse me. I can't, uh, I can't pause the recording. 
<coughs> okay, I can't pause the recording and start later. It's just going to run. I will get my ability to talk back. It links to Renle Chateau because the story is almost the same. Uh, there's a group of brothers, in, uh, and here is the priesthood, They're do, uh, and, and the brothers are doing alterations to their building. Sonia is doing alterations to his church. When the brothers in the story find something they're working on and reveal it's a hidden vault where something special would be found. That's the exact story, same story as Sonia. And so you're wondering, is the story that um, that Desaad first presented in the 1960s, 400 years after the end of the story. So again, this 400 year period, this, this, this number of 400 uh, seems to be a very odd recurring key cycle. And that's something that has to either happens on its own or is forced to happen by the universe. I don't know. But when you, when you're looking at when Sonier is, is dealing with his things in the 1880s and the 1890s, that's roughly 400 years after, I don't know, I guess it's 300 years, isn't it? 16 hundreds. Okay, then forget what I was saying. I don't know why I'm throwing in 400. But anyway, the point is, the question is, when Desaad was writing in the 1960s, was he writing a real story or was he writing a myth? Was he, was he, was he repurposing in some way? I mean, we know there's a real story. There's something that happened with Sonia. There's definitely events that took place. There's, there's detailed information, but the story that's created around it seems mythological and is part of it the retelling of this Christian Rosencruz tale. And um, in the final part of the, of the, of the three ma manuscripts in The Chemical Wedding, when the main character, Christian Rosencruz, stumbles on the tomb of Lady Venus, her body lying undecayed in a death-like slumber has great similarities to the fairy tale Sleeping Beauty, which not only is a key hermetic myth, myth but it's also mentioned by name in this document, The Serpent Rouge, that we will get to. So it's like, again, uh, all the things that are going on with the story of Christian Rosencruz and these three manuscripts, this links to the story. You've also got to look in the story of Francis Bacon, because Francis Bacon was, uh, well, a little before the 1600s, uh, was a key member of Europe, making connections all over all over Europe, and had was basically the link to tons of secret societies, seemingly behind the formation of the initial colonies in, in the United States. <laughs> and two people are key to the life of Francis Bacon. One is John Dee, who had who was known by the secret code number 007 that Ian Fleming used to be create James Bond, and uh, and Robert Flood. And Robert Flood is, a, of course, the famed alchemist who links to the Renle Chateau story, not only in, in uh, various texts, but the January 17 date that is uh, linked supposedly to Flood's finding of the Philosopher's Stone, to Calvay um, supposedly buying the house or the castle or whatever it was where Robert Flood lived. And so it also then links to John Dee, it links to Francis Bacon. Uh, I don't want to go into too, too much detail into, into Dee and Bacon at this point, but um, you have to remember that one of the things Bacon seemed to work with was a secret group called the Family of the, or the House of Love. Uh, love also being uh, in, in Egypt would be uh, Tom Mary, would be Mary, being the, the word for love. So you could also say the House of Mary as the House of Love. And this group appears to have been a, a bunch of initiates transmitting occ occult truths and mystical knowledge through everything that they do. And he has a stylized letter A in his book, Académie Françoise, which he dedicated to Henry III. And some are wondering if this particular link goes all the way through to something we're going to find in one of the next videos known as the AA, which runs through this 1800s time period of Saunière in southern France of this very bizarre organization that no one can figure out what it is. No one even knows what the AA stands for, just that it's some secret organization that Sonier seems to be involved with, as well as Boudet and all the other priests, and yes, might be linked to not just um, the Society St. Sulpice, not only linked to Francis Bacon and John Dee, and perhaps linked as far back to the Cathars and the Knights Templar. Okay, I'm going to leave my examination at this point. Um, Again, you know, please don't leave comments that, you know, say, why don't you look into this? There's more research. You can, yeah, this, this is a lifetime of research. And to have even done any justice to this, I would have had to add six more months to the um, tremendous time of research that I've done. Um, we all have limited time here. We all have limited resources and abilities and 
especially the way the world is going now, I'm presenting what I've got to you at this point. If I had six more months, I would present something a little deeper, a little more different probably. But um, if you want to add useful information that helps people, great. Don't attack me for uh, presenting what I've got. I'm, I'm just sharing the research I've got with you as it is at this moment, and you can go from there. <clears throat> okay, I'm a little cold, actually. I haven't had the fire going while I'm doing this. I'm going to make myself some tea and warm myself up. And... Um, uh, come back in a few days after this with the uh, next chapter of um, Falling for Truth. We're almost done with that. I've only got two chapters to read, but the next one's a long chapter. I'm going to have to break it up into parts. Uh, so there'll be a few installments to get those chapters done. I've still got, I think, three or four more pieces of this Rennes Chateau, Southern France story to get through, and I want to get through those sort of just after the Easter period and then hopefully take the channel on a, and the research on a, on a totally new, new roadway. Uh, so thanks for sitting around, joining. Hopefully there's something interesting that you might want to research a little bit further or think about. Um, to, you know, the people who are following and subscribing, watching the videos, as always, you know, thanks for dropping your comments and uh, saying hi. That's great for the donations that are still coming in through my PayPal account and the books that are being sold and whatnot. Thanks again for supporting. There's There's... A lot of time goes into not only the time currently to put this together and to make it, but you know this was five or six years of study uh, over various parts of time just to compile this information. So it's been a lot of work over over many years to uh, put together what's coming out now. So thank you for everyone that is feeling the need to say thank you and, and support what I'm doing. So we'll see you with uh, another installment of Falling for Truth in a few days, and uh, thanks for watching.